Welcome everyone to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Woohoo! We're going to have so much fun this week. I don't know if Justin can hear us, if there's a lag between us and him. The internet is interesting in Denmark, apparently at five in the morning. We're getting going with the science and we're so thankful that you're here with us tonight. Thanks for joining us. Time for time to start. Yeah. We ready? We ready? We ready? Woo! Justin, you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the delay on this side at all. So if it's there, uh, my apologies. No, we're great. We are great. You know what? Sometimes you just got to take a, take a leap, make it go. Oh, internet <laughs> and technology, you will do us well this evening. I know. All right, everyone, let's start this show in. Oh, wait, let me move that over so I can read that. In three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 902, recorded on Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. Who's thankful for science? I think everyone here right now. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with duplications, Europe Europeans? No, Europeans and frogs. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. No new action on curbing emissions. That's the result of the COP27 meeting. Nothing, zero, zilch. All the speeches, all the media hype, all the past commitments amounted to nothing. There were no agreements to reduce carbon, no agreements to phase out coal and oil industry subsidies, no agreements on rethinking agricultural practices, no agreements to meet past commitments on afforestation, no agreements on industry aerosol reduction, no agreements to fund research solutions to scale alternative energy or to face the increasing environmental degradation heading our way. If anything, it was a total surrender to another generation of complete reliance on fossil fuels. The 27th Conference of the Party's Convention on Climate Change was a massive public failure of leadership and political resolve, one that deeply discredited the urgency with which governments of the world claim to be taking the issue of climate change. And it was perhaps the most productive meeting we could have asked for. It provided a clear roadmap of dead ends, of non-starters. Notably, the United Nations will not be leading us to a solution. It offered confessions of culpability in the way of loss and damages, payments to the nations most affected by global warming, though done so with no clear outline of how those funds will be distributed, who will pay, or when. And it solidified the belief among many that the political power industry is greater than the collective will of a majority of global citizens who want action. So what is next? Science. It has the solutions. Without funding and legislation, those solutions are not likely to be realized. But if we keep working on them, increasing the feasibility and diversity of those solutions, eventually the world will have no other option then complete and total reliance on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. Oh, Kiki, you're muted. <laughs> Darn it! 
<laughs> Good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about science on this pre Thanksgiving Day, Day of Giving Thanks. Also, that we'd like to say thanks to the indigenous peoples of the United States for all they have done and all the knowledge they can bring and all the land that we have put our homes upon and the reality that we are now standing in a place that was pre previously peopled by the indigenous peoples. But let's and, talk is, about and is currently, and is currently. And is, well, no, well, not, not, not this spot. But, and currently. Not this spot. And currently, but we, I mean, we did put in various places. And yeah, okay, anyway. All sorts of colonization so stuff. Occupied going territory. On. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little bit. That's 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 where I was going with that. But welcome everyone. I am so glad that you are here and thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us on this day. I'm always grateful for you joining us for science. Let's talk about it. What do I have for this week? I have tons of science news about bat genes, fat birds and makeup. What do you have, Justin? I have got uh, a couple of stories to do with global warming. I've got some just good news, mass extinction edition. And if I make it to the end of the show with, uh, with the internet, uh what was it what was one more story i'm missing oh gosh what was it what was it oh and then there's another story too. oh yeah uh waste uh a way a use of wastewater that we haven't thought of oh. before i guess fantastic i mean yeah. usually we just want to clean the wastewater but a use for wastewater Maybe that's mm -hmm. a positive direction. Blair, what is in the yes. animal corner? Oh, I have such good conversation topics for everyone celebrating Thanksgiving tomorrow. I can't wait for you to bring yes. this up around the yes. table. Um, yes. I have uh, fish mothers that eat their babies. I have uh, how exactly frogs swallow and uh, sh chimps showing off to their parents. <laughs> so. Show off chimps. Nice themed show today. I think it's going to be fantastic. And I hope everyone's looking forward to all that we are bringing today. As we jump into the show, I want to remind you all that if you are not yet subscribed, you can find us all places podcasts are found. You can find us streaming live Wednesday evenings, 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We are normally this week in science, but we're also at Twist Science on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. Our website is twist.org. But now let's jump in to that big old turkey we like to call science. Okay, no. Uh, yeah. Anyway, there's going to be lots. Yeah, of what did you base your science in this week? <laughs> Thanksgiving jokes. Um, the first thing I want to stuff into your heads is <laughs> a little bit. Uh, it, it's it's a little batty. Yes, we are going to talk about bat viruses. We've talked about bat viruses with respect to COVID and other diseases before, and the reality that we know that bats harbor lots of viruses. In fact, they are reservoirs for these viruses where the viruses kind of do battle and mutate and figure out ways out. And then potentially because people and bats or the other parts of the ecosystem that bats interact with and humans interact, eventually those, vi the, those viruses potentially can jump to humans. So one of the big questions is, what is it about the bat immune system that allows them to harbor so many viruses and not get sick with them themselves? Because that's what happens. These bats, they get infected, but they don't get sick. So the question is, what's going on in their genes? And a study was just published this week in Science Advances called Adaptive Duplication and Genetic Diversification of Protein Kinase R contribute to the specificity of bat virus interactions. So what does this mean? Well, the researchers uh, dug into a bunch of bat genomes and in doing so, they were able to determine that there is 
uh, this one particular family of genes, protein kinase R. And the protein kinase R gene, somewhere along the way, it got duplicated. And so bat genomes, and they looked at 33 species uh, of more than Oh, focusing on 33 of more than 130 different species of mouse-eared bats. This is from the genus Myotis. Um, they were able to determine that there was at least one duplication, but most species had more than two copies. So there were multiple duplications of this particular gene that is specifically called EIF2AK2. Um, they found also closely related sequences, so not only just duplications, but duplications and very slight alterations, but all still within this uh, group of genes that create these protein kinases, which are enzymes that are active in the immune system. And so the idea is that these enzymes then are part of beating up and battling and eating, eating up viruses. And the viruses and the bats well, have been doing battle for a very long time. Yes. What? Well, it's just yeah. interesting because uh, um, <clears throat> kinase enzymes tend to add, be additive. Uh, they like usually look for stuff and they go, oh, hey, you're, you've got your phosphate hat. Here, put that right. on. Now you're good to put go. Yeah, there. They're like, kind of yeah. running around, finding people walking down the street, missing an accessory, and they fix them up and send them on their way again. So is it so? So yeah, I'm curious how this is working now. Is it is it finding uh, bits of the virus and going? Oh no, you're dressed all wrong, and then you know putting it in some right. big mitten. You need it. You need a phosphate hat anymore. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You you need that hat. You don't need that hat. Oh, you need that. You don't need that. Exactly. Changing around the. I mean, we, these protein kinases are doctor seussing the viruses up. Um, yeah. They are have have been a very specific aspect of how these bats are battling viruses and don't get infected by them. Uh, they determined, they say in this abstract, that duplicated PKRs of the myotis species have undergone genetic diversification, allowing them to collectively escape from and enhance the control of DNA and RNA viruses. This suggests that viral-driven adaptations in PKR contribute to modern virus-bat interactions and may account for bat-specific immunity. And if, uh, and if this is indeed the case, this starts to give us a target to look at. Um, and it starts to potentially tell us how we can target viruses, you know, where their weak spots are, what we can, what we can start going after. And if we understand how the bats evade the viruses, maybe it can help us evade the viruses as well. But it hmm. is very indicative of predator-prey interactions. The researchers said that going into these genomes, they really were able to see that these viruses and bats have been like the immune system of bats versus viruses have been like ratcheting up at each other for millennia. So this, this isn't so much why bats are such great zoonotic carriers it's more why their populations aren't destroyed by the viruses that when they hop to us are really detrimental right well it's kind of both yeah it's um yeah it's how they're yeah. good carriers but it's also you know why they don't really get sick right mm -hmm. i mean they can carry it and not mm -hmm. you know their populations aren't decimated so yeah right. but it also it also leads to the mutations that many mm -hmm. viruses are having that potentiate that jump to humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a good virus doesn't kill its host. It, yes. it keeps it alive. So so yes. it's um it's a perfect incubator for that reason. So yes. they can fight it. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. And, it, and again, huh. it's it's probably, I would think, like just largely an accident of nature that gets this started in the in the first place. Um, anything else yeah. that these viruses are showing up into, they could be killing off a population. Or a portion of the mm -hmm. population, which also then reduces the virus's uh, ability to treat um, It yeah. very much reminds me of uh, cats toxo, because uh, the way that uh, cause I keep wondering, like where where to Toxoplasma gondii got into cats, because the, the, from what we've understood, the 
one of the mechanisms is they they lack an enzyme uh, mm. in their gut that allows reproduction to take place. So right. the T. gondii probably started in something non-mammal because all mammals, except for cats, who seem to have had a, an evolutionary oopsie where they've lost this enzyme. <laughs> Every every other mammal has it, and, they, and it doesn't reproduce. And so it finds sometimes their their parasites are very oppor- opportunistic, yep. and they happen to get into something that through whatever evolutionary oopsies that have taken place, go ah, this is a, a great home to continue to do my uh, reproduction, or I won't get kicked out. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, researchers are looking into bats. We need to understand the bats, the cats, and all the viruses and what they're doing. And I'm glad that researchers are finding out more about what leads to the viruses that end up affecting us. Justin, what did you bring? What do you want to talk about next? <clears throat> all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait. Grouchy Gammers is a, do the cat families also have the virus? It's not a virus. It's a parasite, uh, T. gondii. Yeah. But the big cats... Uh, from my understanding, make some of the enzyme. It's a lower level than I think you know, a lot of other mammals. I know they, they can carry the it enzyme. because because but they, everybody they don't can want, carry it. They don't want Any pregnant zookeepers to clean out uh, yeah. the the hay bales, the kitty the, cages, the, the, the cats. Oh. Yes. So they must so reproduce there's a concern. there as well. Yeah. yeah. So then, how well, far and there's back theories that it reproduces history. in otters too. It kind of there's confusion about it. It's not the the, the jury's out on exactly where it's otters. happening. I haven't heard about yeah. the otter thing yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what do I got? I have uh, this is climate change, which could sound like a thermostat setting. Global warming, which could sound like a snug sweater near a campfire on a chilly morning just as the sun comes up. Mm-hmm. My personal preference for calling it climitia never caught on, but would have sounded more appropriate to my ear. Common misnomer is that global temperature will be rising uniformly worldwide they will not warming during summer months in europe and elsewhere has been increasing faster than the global average according to researchers at stockholm university who have published new findings in the journal geophysical research atmospheres the climate across the european continent has become not just hotter but also drier leading to worse heat waves and risk of fire even referencing back to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, warming over land areas occurs significantly faster than over oceans. The goal to stay under 1.5 degrees warming has to do with global average ocean temperatures. That's where that main focus has been. On land, measurements reveal that warming in large parts of Europe has already surpassed 2 degrees in the summer months. In Southern Europe, feedback loops caused a global uh, caused by global warming are being amplified due to drier so- soil and decreased evaporation, and there has been less cloud coverage over large parts of er- Europe as a result of less water vapor in the air. Study also includes a section about the estimated impact of aerosol particles on te- temperature increase. So warming is uh, mostly a consequence of these long-lived greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. These are things that trap heat. They can collect uh, infrared solar radiation and then shoot it back down at the planet. So they just, they're just uh, like a nice warm blanket, heated blanket. Emissions of shorter-lived aerosol particles, like say soot from a cold power Cold-fired power plant have uh, decreased greatly over the last 40 years, which is a good thing because that emits a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and is toxic, radioactive. Oh, gosh, you burn coal, you get a lot of radioactive isotopes floating around. But they're pointing out the suit did uh, also do something else because that kind of an aerosol in the atmosphere scatters sunlight back out into space and actually has a mild cooling effect on the local areas. So as dirty greenhouse gas emitting power plants have been replaced, their 
localized cooling effects have also gone away, which then reveal the true effects of the greenhouse gas increases and heat uh, attributed to them. So there's kind of a double whammy going on as a lot of, especially in, this is uh, largely, I think, Southern Eastern Europe has moved away from these coal power plants. Uh, the accelerated heating on land is being shown above two degrees in the summers already. Yeah. And we've, of course, seen some of the heat waves in other parts of the world as well that are unprecedented. But yeah, the the whole blowing past the 1.5 that we've been seeing in the news because the COP27 meeting didn't do anything. 1.5 was also... <laughs> For the IPCC's reports, was also the rosiest number. It was the low end of the spectrum of where what we were in for to begin with, and it only counts if you're on the open ocean. <laughs> Overland, you're, you're already there. You may have even blown past it already. But at the number itself, the 1.5 is the global average. So when you talk about overland, over water, it's cumulatively averaging all of those all of those higher numbers and lower numbers and putting it together. So yes, we are well, globally, yet locally there are these regions. Yes, in the summertime, we're blowing past stuff where the ocean is keeping things um, you know, cooler. But yeah, the, what, what this really suggests is it's good we're cleaning things up. Seeing what we're actually doing is like a slap in the face and Nobody wants to do anything about it. They just want to shove all the dirty stuff in the closet and shut the door and ignore it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so the, the problem with that, though, of course, is that the planet is mostly ocean. Yes. So if, if the oceans are at 1.5 and mm -hmm. we know that it's dramatically higher over land. Yeah, it's you know, you, over. Yeah. Well, you get to the average of 1.5. Uh, the oceans may be at 1.2 and everything else mm -hmm. is at three. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, the ratio there. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly what they're, what they're tracking. Yes. There's a little bit, it's more global. There's other sources, but it's mostly uh, an ocean temperature thing. That 1.5, everything else is going to be well above that. <sighs> we are going, it's what's happening. Uh, there were, some agreements made at COP27, whether or not you agree with the way that they're going to be putting money away, the political decisions. Um, I'm glad these conversations are happening, but, but yeah, but there, it's but going you, to be, you, it, the solutions are really going to have to be yeah. more and it's going to have yeah. to be a different. Approach. We're going to play catch up in a big way. Yeah. <laughs> That's very yeah, clear so is that like that we're borrowing from tomorrow is what's currently happening. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, everyone's going to go, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, what's happened? <laughs> and, like, yeah. try to backtrack. And that's going to be way harder than it's trying to harder. do things now. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's only getting harder and harder. So there's already a problem with their whole loss and payment scheme idea. Yeah. It's because they can't uh, agree on whether or not they're going to base those payments on current emitters. Mm -hmm. of which India and China would have to pay a lot of money or yeah. historic emitters in which right. China and India would pay a lot problem. less. But, like, well, and the, the other problem like, is so that, that certain countries are selling the oil that then other countries are burning. So then mm -hmm. who pays for that? And mm -hmm. currently it's looking like the people doing the burning, but there's also the selling of the mm -hmm. oil, which is part of the deal. So it's, you know, the, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. We have so, solutions. So then nobody's we getting any money. This. And if the we money goes to any of these yes. countries, it's not going to, it's going to be so vague. And so it, it's not going to go to people who are hurt. It's not going to go to the local farmer who lost his crops because of global warming. It's not going to go to any of these people. It's just not. Hopefully. Stop. Don't pretend. Don't pretend. Your dollars is that it's actually there. going to go into the building of structures that burn fossil fuels? Because yeah, like, or be part of soccer the stadium. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Hopefully, it'll go into the construction of sustainable 
fuels, solar panels, no. wind farms, nothing you know, hydro to that. generation. Nothing to that for that. Mm -mm. No, there's no mm. language in any of it that That's indicates any of it would go there. Mm -hmm. Any, yeah. there's none. You know, I am thankful for science because it tells me things, and you know, it sometimes you can just ignore the people and the politics. So anyway, let's move yes. away from yes. <laughs> the changing climate, climatia, and, um, you know, this disease we've given our planet. And let's talk about birds trying to fly yeah. through the air. Yes, I know many yes. people will be boarding an airplane uh, today, tomorrow, yes. Friday. And when they do, you know, one of the things you really don't want is turbulence on your flight. And to Whoa. know if you might have a turbulent flight, maybe you should ask the pigeons. This is a study uh, with academics from Swansea University collaborating with University of Leeds, the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior, and the University of Constance. And they looked at flying a small aircraft along and close to a track of pigeons. They wanted to measure the turbulence levels and see if pigeons might have something to tell us beyond the instruments we currently use to measure turbulence. <laughs> can, they so measured... can, can we use b birds bouncing in yes. the air to tell us about yes. the air? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. the unsteadiness of the birds, the bump up and down, this can be used to understand how turbulent the conditions are. They, uh, they, they hooked up some, some backpacks, essentially, <laughs> to these pigeons. And um, they compared the measurements that they collected, uh, GPS, barometric pressure, and acceleration data. They compared that to that measured by an, an anemometer. I always <laughs> want to say it wrong. Anemometer on board the aircraft. That's how English works. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Anyway, so lots of syllables. Uh, so basically, they, they, they looked at these two things. And they found out that they could indeed use bird-borne sensors to calculate free stream turbulence in nature. This, of course, depends on the pigeons going where you're interested in getting measurements. So there is that kind of interesting caveat of, do you train the pigeons? Do you just measure pigeons everywhere? And for the most part, um, they, they're looking specifically at using this to measure these conditions in areas where it's kind of inaccessible to humans. So they they likened it to using seals with sensors on to measure salinity and sea temperatures under ice caps. So they could use they could strap some some backpacks onto these birds and send them into areas that are remote or difficult to access to collect atmospheric data. What's interesting is that remember, you know, it depends on where the pigeons go. Um, right. is that the pigeons could fly in conditions that were too turbulent for sensors, uh, for the kind of our, our, um, our, our sensors that are not strapped to pigeons. <laughs> but there was also some suggestion on how pigeons might have avoided certain routes with very high turbulence. That could be data that you could include. This pigeon went way out of their way to go over here. That means there's a high turbulence area in this space. So that also raises the question of how birds cope with high turbulence and the effect that it has on flight costs. Because if you're going way out of the way to avoid turbulence, then you know that, that does make your flight longer or more difficult or takes you off course. You have to spend more time and energy navigating any number of things that come as a result of that. But basically the long and short of this is that birds could be used as a remote sensor for wind turbulence <laughs> and that uh, it could allow us to go places where our normal um, devices cannot go and fly in conditions that our normal devices could not fly in. So there you go. I feel like this study was done by a researcher who accidentally crossed over from the parallel dimension where all air travel is done by Zeppelin. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, we could outfit we could outfit all the, the the zeppelins with with pigeons who will tell them about current right. turbulence conditions, and we can send them out, and they will find us the best route. Like, See, I'm th I'm picturing more like, ladies and gentlemen, if you look to the right of your aircraft, you will see the Grand Canyon. And if I look at my pigeon friends out in front, they are bobbing up and down, which means we're in for a 
bit of a bumpy ride here, so just strap in and uh, stay seated. <laughs> so, they tied to the wing? Like, no, where are these pigeons? Tied, <laughs> we're tying yeah. them to the wing. No, I, I mean, How I do wonder. Why? How high? Is it? <laughs> Not that fast. <laughs> Yeah, How fast like, can know. a pigeon fly? How fast can a pigeon fly? How far? How mm-hmm. much turbulence can a yeah. pigeon take? How like what what determines how a pigeon chooses its route? What is it that the birds see in the air that we can't see? How do yes, they and this do is they still watch a question. the clouds? What do they know? Right. And this is still a question we're trying to answer because we still don't have a firm grasp on how pigeons navigate the landscape yeah so is this part of that no idea oh i bet you i know how they do it i just figured it out i got it i got it we just learned that insects flying uh emit electrical field Uh uh-huh if pigeons can see an electrical field they can say hey Uh there's no insects in the air over there must be too turbulent i'll go this way that's it. That's their, they're navigating by a yeah. smaller winged creature. By bug. Yeah, yeah. got it. And then the what bugs are, are doing it by uh, bacteria, right? Yeah, and they're, then... yeah, they're listening to the flowers, which are listening oh, to the okay. bacteria. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, right. You missed a step there, yeah. Yeah, all right. Everybody... Oh, there was a talking flower story. We didn't, I didn't it's bring probably, it. Everybody's, everybody's following those electric fields, I'm sure. The yeah. ions uh, are a sensory field that are very important. But we have to. We'd have to look into that. So next step, pigeons. How do they sense mm-hmm. changes in the ion fields? Yeah. Yes. Well, after that uh, Thanksgiving meal or that Thanksgiving travel that you're doing, flying pigeon air, um, you are going to have a meal, and at some point you'll probably have to go to the bathroom, and there may be some defecation involved. And sometimes if there's defecation involved and you look in the toilet, you go, oh, that sank or, oh, look, a floater. And what on earth determines the difference between? Well, Oprah told me it was about calcium. It's not about calcium. <laughs> That's, Oprah had a whole show about it, I think, in the 90s. Yeah, well, floating poop means calcium. It's, well, Oprah was not- wrong? Our, our information has come a ways. Oh. And you know, now the microbiome is a big area of research. There was some uh, question, not related to calcium, but whether oil levels determined the buoyancy of your fecal matter. Um, but these researchers who published their paper in Scientific Reports, they're from the Mayo Clinic, they had uh, germ-free mice they had experimentally microbially colonized mice and they had naturally gut colonized mice and they compared the different buoyancies of the food that passed through and you want to know what they determined those mice that had no bacteria the germ-free mice they produced sinkers So bacteria are partially responsible for what's going on. uh, And what is responsible is the amount of gas that the bacteria are producing. So gas producing bacteria, Bacterioides ovatus, is one species that has been linked to flatulence in humans. Um, There are other forms of bacteria that they specifically worked with. But really, the more gas that your bacteria produce, the more you're going to have a floater. But there's a huge problem with this. Mice don't eat what we eat. Mice do not eat what we we eat, but they do have, you know, they 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 do have bacteria that we have. Right. And I just, so different bacteria. Their so different from ours. <laughs> but they can have sinkers or floaters, apparently. And they took away the bacteria, and they sank. It's all about gas. This is really hard for me to buy. I understand. (laughs) I understand in in terms of mouse sinkers and floaters. I'm on board. It sounds great. But but applying it to humans or other species, like 
Also, mostly lab mice eat like pellet food, which is homogenous and is always right. exactly the same. And our our diet is extremely varied. And so in, if you if you are eating the exact same thing every day, then your sinker or floater might have to do with the amount of bacteria. But I'm just saying there's other things involved in what is in the poop. Right. But what you eat is it's also a, a, a you know, a two way highway. What you eat influences what's in your gut. And so when you have, say, more fiber or more beans or other things that lead to more gas production, that's going to lead to right. different formations of things. I'm just saying, like, your diet. multiple things could make potentially, we don't know, right? But multiple things could make feces sink or float. It doesn't just Truth. have to be the bacteria, right? So, yes. It's. Based yeah. on this experiment, we don't know if changing their diet, but maintaining a certain, like, keep seeding them the same bacteria over and over, would that change a, anything? We don't know yeah. that, right? We uh, Yeah, you're right. Fair point. Point to Blair. And <laughs> <laughs> everyone, see how your Thanksgiving meal goes. Yeah. And remember, <laughs> if you smell something at the table and it's not the turkey coming from the turkey, it don't blame your relatives. It's their microbes. It's their microbes. It's the dog. It's that's the that's dog. one of the reasons to have a dog. <laughs> blame the dog. <laughs> now we know, Blair. Okay, just <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about waste. Justin, do you have more waste to uh, waste our audience's time yeah, on? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah, this is follows nicely, apparently. Uh, according to environmental engineering researchers at Drexel University, we should be using our sewage wastewater to fertilize crops. The production of nitrogen... For fertilizer, energy is uh, energy intensive, and accounts for nearly two percent of global carbon dioxide emissions. It's higher than I thought it would have been. New study looks at a process for removing ammonia from wastewater and converting it into fertilizer, and it suggests that it's technically viable. It would reduce the carbon footprint of fertilizer production, creating a circular nitrogen economy. This, is according to Patrick Gurian, a professor in Drexel U College of Engineering, quoting, This means we are using existing nitrogen rather than expending energy and generating greenhouse gas to harvest nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is, more, which is a more sustainable practice for agriculture and could become a source of revenue for utilities. Under the Clean Water Act, 1972 in the United States, municipal water treatment facilities have to meet certain standards of quality control for the water that they are discharging back into the waterways. Ammonia is at elevated levels in wastewater and can result in overgrowth in vegetation, which then can kill uh, fish if it's released. So they have a couple of options. One is they create uh, a lot of, it takes a lot of time and they put out in these big fields and sort of let it off gas slowly over time. And other ways that they do it can be rather energy intensive. So one of the options that they, they've been looking at here is something called air stripping, which removes ammonia by raising the temperature and pH of the water enough to convert the chemical into a gas, which can then be collected in a concentrated form as ammonium sulfate. Using data from Philadelphia's water treatment facility and several others across North America and Europe, the team conducted its, a, a life cycle assessment, uh, an economic feasibility assessment. They looked at the factors ranging from the cost of installing and maintaining the air stripping system to the concentration of ammonia and flow rate of the wastewater to the sources of energy used to drive the collection and conversion process to and down, down to the production and transportation cost and market price that the fertilized fertilizer chemicals uh, would have there. So pretty, it sounds like they did a pretty nice print analysis, a feasibility analysis of this thing. They said the findings of the feasibility analysis show the air stripping emits 
five to 10 times less greenhouse gas than current nitrogen producing processes used to make fertilizer. And it uses about 15 times less energy, making the overall cost of producing the fertilizer this way from the, from the wastewater far, far cheaper, magnitude cheaper than That's it would great. be the old way. Yeah. So this also cuts the time and processing needed to treat the water, which means the, the turnaround time of getting that uh, wastewater back into fresh water out back into the environment would be faster which could be helpful. So the process is, uh, wouldn't replace chemical production of nitrogen for fertilizer uh, right. because there's just, there's, we make so much of that and there's, we just don't have enough just a huge of need. our own wastewater. Yeah. To, yeah. But it would, uh, it would be a reduction and it would be a sustainable reduction. And it's just, it's taken one more thing out of the footprint. Uh, and, and that's what we need. You know, that's, we, there are some big solutions out there that can be looked at, can be addressed, can be discovered, can be scaled up to some degree. But usually once you look at scaling up, like the afforestation thing that's going to take over uh, something 30% uh, larger than the United States mm. of dense trees. Mm -hmm. right. Or the something like 250,000 or million, some of those those carbon capture uh, container things that we, they built a while ago. They've been being, being built. I think those might be in Norway. Uh, there's a lot of big scale, but there's a lot of small solutions. And if you string enough of the small solutions together, you get a decent amount of the way there. And I just the like, kind of thing. Oh, I was just say this is the kind of thing that you, if you have an industry that's producing extra uh, ammonium or nitrogen, you know, nitrates and ammoniums that ammonia that you can use that and create another product. And so this is, you know, take a byproduct, turn it into a product as opposed to just letting it into the atmosphere or even take it out of the atmosphere, like you were saying. And you know, I think that is part of. The benefit especially you know reducing the polluting that we do into our atmosphere but blair yeah 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 the i think that's exactly it is thinking about the ammonia that we produce with our bodies as um a byproduct or something that needs to be processed when before we lived in these buildings with plumbing mm -hmm. that was actually part of the whole nitrogen cycle yeah is you consume food you release nitrogen back into the soil and it fertilizes the soil and allows for more food to be grown. And as we've kind of sanitized our lives, we've removed ourselves from that cycle. Right. And so that's that's the problem is we're kind of like we're we're messing it up on both ends. We're, we're <laughs> processing out and kind of sequestering the nitrogen that we're naturally producing. And then we're pulling it out of the atmosphere because we're like, mm. we need more nitrogen. <laughs> it's like, it's actually, it's right. We're supposed to make it and it's supposed yeah. to go back into the ground. So I love the idea of trying to reestablish that connection that is supposed to exist. When you say supposed to exist, though, I mean yeah, agriculture is part of the process. Old. We used to, we used to go, we used to be hunting. No, not I'm you'd talking poop, about like you'd, like animals. You poop by a like tree, basic wild and then animals. you'd go like, okay, we got to keep going. Yeah, we're not camping here tonight. Woo! And so, and so. No, we, but if, we, if we you're did. if you're a deer, if you're a deer, you pee oh, and you poop you. on the ground. Yeah. And more plants grow. That's kind of the basis of the nitrogen cycle, and that's. That's where we, you know, that and dead stuff, right? And that's we where were, we're all coming from. Yeah, and we were a part of that as well before we started putting ourselves into an uh, agricultural uh, culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were hunter-gatherers. We were wandering around. Maybe we had middens or areas that uh, were latrines that we created when we were in our tribal uh, stages of development. Um, but, you know, that's still part of it. Um, mm -hmm. There was, yeah. Start still part of the yeah, but, I mean, it, but, but the agriculture re revolution. When we stopped going, uh, traveling very far. You know, we staying for uh, years or generations in one location. Yeah. Then we started to have to mitigate. You know, the, that the waste. that midden wasn't yes. at the edge of the thing. Was now in the middle of town. Uh oh. Yeah. So so we've been we've been trying to distance ourselves from this as a problem 
for yep. for now thousands of years that yeah it took, it took that long to occur to us like oh yeah maybe there's something uh useful in the maybe way we that can the give na- natural cycle of things up yeah <laughs> um let's see is anyone gonna have vegetables at their thanksgiving meal tomorrow yeah well Certainly. think about their memories and how okay. they, <laughs> you make memories at the Thanksgiving table. How are these plants going to pass on their memories? Anyway, researchers uh-huh. published in Trends in Plant Science this last week on their work uh, figuring out how plants are able to ad- adapt to the adverse effects of climate change, how they're passing down adaptations to offspring. And one of the things that really stuck out to me in uh, the the telling of this story is uh, one of the the lead researcher, Federico Martinelli, who's a plant geneticist at the University of Florence, saying that, um, you know, plants don't have brains, they don't have nerves, they don't have a way to store their memories, and they don't have language, they don't have a way to tell stories and pass things down informationally um, in a, you know, the way we think of our storytelling and informational pass down. Um, And he says, one day I thought how the living style and experience of a person can affect his or her gametes, transmitting molecular marks of their life into their children. Immediately I thought that even more epigenetic marks must be transmitted in plants, being that plants are sessile organisms that are subjected to many more environmental stresses than animals during their lives. So as the seasons change, as cold seasons get shorter, as hotter seasons get longer, as the wet season dries up, how do plants send information on how to survive down to the next generation um, from what they've learned in just the most recent period of time? Not, you know, the stuff that's not necessarily bound up in the DNA. And this researcher then said, well, it's definitely going to be based in epigenetics. These mechanisms allow plants to recognize the occurrence of a previous environmental condition and react more promptly in the presence of the same consequential condition. And so in their work, they highlighted a number of key genes, proteins, oligonucleotides um, that are involved in abiotic stresses like drought, salinity, cold, heat, heavy metals, pathogens, et cetera. And they provide a, they, they've provided a whole bunch of examples for the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for plant memories. And that it's, you know, plants have to have had another way to transmit information from generation to generation than simply DNA or storytelling. There's got to be something else there. And so... Um, the way they the way they tell this story in this particular paper is that it's the epigenome that is very important to this uh, to this these these memories. It's somatic memory that can be then hmm. translated transgenerationally. Once again, I will say, Lamarck, we're sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're sorry. We're sorry, Lamarck. You were right on that. Yeah, you had some good ideas. Mm-hmm. The giraffe was maybe a little much, but like you, you had the basic idea down. You really did. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I said I said no to Lamarck so many times when I, I thought I knew so much from my genetics classes in university. I was so wrong. And Justin, actually, you used to be like, "Oh, in Lamarck, let's talk about Lamarck." And yeah, well, yeah. you know, because it you were it, on it. it it just makes. It just makes sense. It does. Uh, it just makes so sense. one of the things too is we've we've seen we've seen evidence of of plants learning, uh, of creating seeding and growth strategies based on a previous generation's access to water. Uh, so so you know we've known this is this exists. We know they have this memory. We know they have right. these amazing abilities. We know they yes. listen. We know they spike their sugar when they hear uh, bees flying by, and there's a, there was this the story that I didn't bring. I've lost. It. I can't find it now. I was thinking about recycling and bringing it in, 
where they're also changing some iridescent coloring. Uh, flowers uh, can alter iridescent coloring on them to signal mm. bees, and they can That's also cool. regulate that up and down in the presence of bees it's to sort of advertise, like, got the good sugars over here. Come check out this pond, whatever they're, you know, Come shouting check out, out there. My sugars. I got a sugar. But they, Ooh, ooh. yeah. Just yeah. Like they have all sorts of other <laughs> tricks to, to lure in uh, pollinators, which is amazing. So. Lure them in and tell the stories through their epigenome. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. Um, but Blair, did you have mm. one more story there? Oh yes, I have. I have a quick one. Just yeah. while you're uh, around the family table tomorrow, if you are celebrating Thanksgiving, and your parents are just really getting on your nerves, well, just just be happy your mom's not a cichlid fish. Um, <laughs> Why that's is that? because. Researchers at Central Michigan University have found um, that uh, cichlid fish, um, it's not so fun to be their babies. That's because in, we know from prior research that uh, cichlids brood their young in their mouths for up to two weeks after their eggs are fertilized. And uh, yeah, you guessed it, about 40% of those offspring get eaten. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Who'd have thought? They looked at 80 females that laid eggs. They were all fertilized by males. After fertilization, they observed how the brooding proceeded. As expected, the mothers kept their offspring in their mouths for two weeks. As they did so, the researchers noted that the mothers didn't eat regular food at all. They also found that the mothers behaved in ways that researchers described as stressed. <laughs> <laughs> the researchers then dissected some of the mothers showing different levels of stress and found that higher levels of stress chemicals in those fish who behaved in more stressed out ways. So yes, they were indeed stressed. On average, the mothers ate approximately 40% of their offspring and 93% of those fish ate at least some of their young. So if you were in that lucky 7%, your mom didn't eat any of you. But that's, they also a, that's found, a rare thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> rare. They also found that those mothers who appeared to be more stressed... You guessed it. They tended to eat more of their babies. Oh, no. <laughs> no yes. Stress um, eating. Oh, my babies. Ah! Yeah. The researchers <laughs> note that eating one of one's offspring might seem like a reduction in reproductive success. Hmm, you think? But it might be offset by health benefits. In addition to nutrients that they get from eating their offspring. Oh, no. Yum, nutrients. <laughs> the mothers also get an antioxidant boost which gives them the energy they need to spawn again in just a few months, which you wouldn't need to do if you hadn't eaten your babies. I'm right. just saying. Yeah. So I don't, I don't quite get that reasoning. I really feel like it is a mechanical mistake. That's what it sounds like to me. You, you're holding a bunch of babies in your mouth. You haven't eaten in two weeks. Oops, I swallowed some. That or really I'm feels like it to out. me. I'm stressed out and I just... <sighs> Take, you know, take a gulp out of the water. And nope, I just swallowed my babies. Oopsie. Yeah. What's You're that? not as careful. That? You don't yeah. you don't want to cook tonight? Yeah, I don't really feel like cooking tonight either. Do you want to order out or should we just eat the baby? <laughs> this doesn't seem like just yeah, one of the babies. Just like forty percent of just, the babies. You know, just forty percent. They'll still make the sixty percent left. Plenty. Plenty to go around. Doesn't sound like a real thought out option. Yeah, it's so just, what you'd want to know. It just really sounds like an oopsie to me. <laughs> right, so you've got 7% of the population who are moms who are maybe not as stressed out, who for whatever reason, their genes are like, da, 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 I'm just coasting through mm -hmm. life, and so they're not mm -hmm. stressed, and they don't, and they've got enough energy, and maybe they're bigger or whatever, but they're fine, and they don't make mistakes because they're super mom, and so anyway, we're not going to talk about them anymore, but mm -hmm. they're out there adding whatever they're adding to the population, right? And then you've mm -hmm. got the big mass of people, oh, not people, sorry. People aren't baby eaters, I, I hope. Um, then you have the majority- Just doing their best. <laughs> the majority of moms who are just trying, right? These chick, just these sick kids are like, they're just trying here. And they're maybe a little bit more stressed out, but their genes are also maybe going to be affecting their anxiety levels and their offspring's anxiety levels. And so, you know, the genetic aspects of this are very interesting to consider. And then I, I there is, but just one second, that what Blair was saying, she didn't really understand like the downstream genetic effects of being eaten. Well, if you are, you know, the, the Punnett Square kind of stuff, if you are half related to your yeah. brothers and sisters, 
that genetic inform you know that benefit mm -hmm. that you've given them yeah. is it is a genetic benefit if you are <sighs> right. helping your mother to have another generation of children. Right. Well, so, and on the whole, if sixty percent make it. it and they were breeding, they were brooding outside of the mouth, and twenty percent made it because the rest of them got eaten by other fish. Yes, it is still beneficial to then brood them in your mouth where you might oops swallow forty percent. Right. Yeah. So if, if it's you a eat net fewer, game, yeah, yeah, then it's still worth it. But it's just, it's very, it's just so funny to be like, you don't say the mother fish with the babies that she ate up. No. What? What? I mean, every we've talked about this. Everybody swallowed gum at some point. If yeah. you walk in and chewing gum, at some point you've accidentally swallowed it. It happens. Oh, I, I used to I used to always swallow my gum intentionally. You know, always. Yeah. <laughs> you could have been that cichlid mom. Oops. Well, but the, the thing that's interesting about this is this can't also be like they've noticed the stress level differences, but you would think that might be a genetic underpinning, but it seems like would that be. would have gotten out by that would have been removed by all the 40% and 60% of of offspring that were removed from the population. Whereas super mom Not fish is putting out a full batch of, of potentially no I mean, stress. there's nobody saying uh, anything about how so. these babies are organized within the mom's mouth. Right. So is right. it completely random? Do these baby eggs have different levels of activity? Are the less, you know, because as these little uh, fish larvae in their in their little, little bubble egg sacs, as they start growing, they're moving around just like you know little babies are oh, i'm in my little bubble egg oh. and moving yeah around. maybe that's and, how they're surviving yeah. and the, so they move the around more. maybe they're the moving better toward... swimmers no, it's just they're not. swimming the wrong way no i was saying the other direction the less active fish are possibly the ones who are just kind of sinking to the back of the mouth where the mother's more likely to swallow them i and think they're swimming it's, that I like think... yeah i'm getting out of here where's this lead and then they just swim i think it's 100 percent a mistake who knows they accidentally swallow some babies <laughs> Totally that mistake. stresses them out because they know they swell. They went, oh no, yeah, <laughs> that's how they get their stress, cycle. right? And it is it is completely random. That seven percent that doesn't swallow any babies, no genetic indicator, just totally random. If you accidentally swallow some no babies, yep. you get stressed out. You show stress hormones. That's my hypothesis. I yeah, I th I say you know as a biologist, we often want to put you know it's survival benefit, right? But sometimes it's just luck of the draw. It's yeah. stochastic chance right this yeah. is Oops. oopsies hey <sighs> my baby okay <sighs> this is this week in science thank you so much for joining us for this episode of science fun if you are enjoying the show right now head over to twist.org where you can find our annual calendar sales are going on that's right right now blair's calendar is up for sale the 2023 twists blair's animal corner calendar is available on our twist website you go to twist.org i'm going to do it right now twist.org and uh there's a link let me show you to you i should have planned to do this ahead of time but of course i didn't but now i'm doing it right now and rachel you can cut all this stuff out here we go at twist.org click on the colorful picture of the twist 2023 blair's animal corner calendar to be taken to zazzle.com where you can purchase the wonderful calendar in a printed format or just below the uh the calendar you will see a link that says purchase the 2023 twist calendar digital download by now that will send you to an embedded page once you've purchased the digital download calendar so that you can download a cmyk full color beautiful pdf that you can print out on your own so head over to twist.org get yourself a calendar get your friends a calendar today we do appreciate you enjoying the show and now let's come on back and I think it's time for a part of the show that we like to call Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, millipede, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, 
she's your girl Except for giant pandas and squirrels What you got, Blair? Oh, my goodness. I have a story I'm really excited to share with everyone today. Um, I, I'm not sure other people will be as interested, but I, let me just explain. So <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I should put myself off, down Blair. ahead of time. I know. I, I know. don't oh, think you're going to be is, interested in this. This is but... late breaking <laughs> frog anatomy news. And I actually, I teased okay. it last week because I was okay. so excited to talk about it. I was like, I have, I have to talk about it. It, it. it broke just before the show last week. Frogs. How did they swallow? <laughs> this is something that we haven't known. There's a lot of confusion around it. It took until the mid 20th century to figure out how their tongues work. They finally figured it out by observing in high speed video, the tongues, so that they figured out they unroll like a party horn. They wrap around their target and in an adhesive hug, they call it, and pull it into their mouths. But what happens after that? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> really difficult to tell because, first of all, how do said uh, treats get unstuck from the tongue? Also, if you watch a frog swallow, what I was told in uh, all of my time working with animals is that their eyeballs push the food down. Because if you watch a frog or wait, a wait, toad wait, wait. swallow. Their eyeballs? So this is what I was always told. Eyeballs. If you watch when they swallow, they close mm -hmm. their eyes and their eyes recede into their head. So th this was the conventional wisdom or educated guess on how frog swallowing worked. The eyeballs push it down. <laughs> but nobody knew for sure. So, uh, researchers used x-ray videography. So they placed toads in a clear observation box. They attached metallic beads at key points in the mouths of cane toads, Ranella marina, and they fed them a steady stream of crickets while filming them with x-ray videography. The thing about frog mouths is that they're super weird. <laughs> um, they have a complex pulley system of cartilage and muscle. They have these crazy tongues that I was talking about before. And they have um, a hyoid, uh, a cartilaginous plate called a hyoid, which a hyoid arch is something we have in our throats, but it's kind of just suspended in midair amongst a bunch of <laughs> not bones, basically. Right. And so the yeah. hyoid in a lot of senses in our neck is is a vestige from from when we were Reptilian. reptiles and amphibians. Yeah. 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 Way back when. I mean and we're so still reptiles they have, technically. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so they so they have this big fat hyoid. They have a cartilaginous mm. plate. Um, or as their hyoid. It has loops and prongs attached to muscles. It rests on the floor of their mouths. And the function so far has been unknown. So you can see where this is going. The hyoid, it turns out, plays a big part in how swallowing works. And the eyes have nothing to do with it. The other crazy <laughs> thing is that a lot of frog species, there's about 7,000 known frog species, which toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads, right? So, um, a bunch of frog species have fang-like teeth on the roof of their mouths, and then toads, which generally don't have teeth, have ridges like a washboard along the upper palate. So they so they have this giant hyoid. They have these weird protrusions that are hard in the roof of their mouth, either teeth or or this washboard made of cartilage. And so what they found was that the whole floor of the mouth was pulled down and backward into the throat and the tongue along with it via the hyoid. They reconstructed the movements into 3D animations. They created a play-by-play -play from still frames to try to figure out exactly what was going on. So the tongue comes out. It reaches its full extent. It grabs its prey. The hyoid then retracts into the throat. The tongue, which is directly attached to the hyoid, slingshots. Back into the mouth because the hyoid is pulling it down. It's going to whoosh, and it pulls the tongue back. So that's the recoil of the tongue. That's where this comes from. 
They're not sure how far the hyoid could move because instead it kind of slams into the frog's heart. <laughs> what? <laughs> and so, yeah. So it's. That's um, why the eyes close. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it, it's actually, it seems to be highly coordinated. It slides up against the heart milliseconds before the tongue smashes into the cartilaginous cushion of the hyoid. The other piece that's crazy is that until now, no one's known how they unstick the prey from their tongue. Because once the tongue has grabbed it, how do they get it off? <laughs> It gets pulled off during this process, right? Yeah. It's like ripped so off. It's ripped off, but they think actually by those things on the roof of their mouths, either the mm. teeth or the or the Ridges. plate. Yeah. So uh, the hyoid shoots up and presses the tongue against the roof immediately afterwards. And it moves forward. It scrapes the food off into the esophagus. So this would explain <laughs> the ridges and fangs on the upper palate. This whole process takes less than two seconds. Most of that time is spent repositioning the tongue in hyoid after it's been slingshotted back and forth. Mm. And so this challenges everything we've assumed about how frogs and toads eat. But the big asterisk here is that this was done on (laughs) cane toads. One species. So now is the time to do a comparative study amongst a bunch of frogs and toads to see whether the feeding behavior of these cane toads is the rule rather than the exception. Is this the Mm -hmm. thing we see everywhere or mostly everywhere in frogs and toads? So, you know, kind of, or did they just pick the worst and most unlucky test subject in the world? (laughs) So hopefully it's that first one. It's a really good example species for all of frogs and toads. But it's it's just so it's so funny to think about how how much of zoology has been based on observation, right? And the more tools that we get at our disposal, and the more ways we can think about to measure how the form and function of animals work, the more we learn. Because just watching frogs and toads, you go, oh, it's the eyeballs. <laughs> They're pushing the food down. <laughs> Duh. I- I have never thought it was the eyeballs, Blair. I have been told (laughs) time and time again that it is the eyeballs. Now now we know. I heard it at every zoo and aquarium I've ever worked at. It's the eyeballs. But now we know it's not the eyeballs. Mm -hmm. It's the hyoid. Which seems like the more likely, actually, if you just, you know, want to think logically about it. It's, it's fine it's anyway think about that while you're swallowing your thanksgiving meal what's your hyoid it's, up to it's the hyoid <laughs> man mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it's the hyoid oh, that i love it so hopefully everybody found that as interesting as i did <laughs> um moving on the, the last thing that uh, might come up tomorrow that I wanted to talk about in terms of the animal kingdom, you know, animals are just like us, is that you might have um, a family member, and if you don't, it's you, who likes to show off. <laughs> <laughs> Say, hey, look at me. Look what I can do. Hey, look at this thing that I got. Hey, check out the new gadget that I bought. I don't know. It's, there's, There's always... We like to You're share right, experiences, me. right? Yeah, yeah it's there me. You go. Yeah. So we like to share experiences. We like to share objects. We like to marvel in things together. And for a long time, it has been assumed that these very specific social interactions were previously only for humans. Can you guess? <laughs> wait, wait, Not, wait. Did yeah. they find? Uh, there's some animal yes there was there's a lot of internet difficulty with that but i think what i heard was um did they yeah, find well, some animal happened? that yeah. does this thing yeah. and the answer did they is they find an animal yes, that does this they oh wait an animal can that i guess which animal yes can i guess cuz i mean it's, i'm guessing from all animals but humans. I'm going to say, huh? <laughs> yeah. Other than humans. 
I want I want to say that it's uh, that I would I could see this happening in chimps. I'd be a little confused, but not surprised if it happened in mice, like what they would be showing off. But I also think birds could be because birds might be like, oh, look at this this interesting tool that I have manufactured and check mm-hmm. out what I can do with it. So now I don't mm-hmm. now, but now I need the real answer. It's chimps. Yeah, you you guessed it (laughs) the first time. Um, But but this is different from saying, look at this tool that I made, because that's social learning. This is showing something off just to go, hey, look at that. Like, throw it over your shoulder and be done with it, right? So this was, here's the big asterisk on this piece. It is one one encounter among two chimps that was observed once. So this is something unusual that was observed that I wanted to just talk about for a second, but this is not a systemic observation amongst chimps in a specific group or amongst the entire species. That needs to be looked at further. However, I feel pretty confident that in chimps and in other animal species, this is something that you will start to see. And we're going to watch the video right now and I will narrate it for our listeners. So there's one chimp who's uh, kind of mouthing a leaf and it's just a leaf. It's not food. It's not a tool. It's not anything she can use. And then she just shows it. She like shoves it in front of the face of a second chimp as if to say like, look at this leaf and then puts it right back and starts looking at it again on her side. So again, there's no food on this leaf. There's no function for this leaf. She's just like, Hey, check out this cool leaf that I found. And that's it. (laughs) So these chimps, Look at it. Um, Look this, at it. Yeah. Look this at is it. A, this is a mother and daughter. So this is the daughter encouraging her mother to just join her in looking at a leaf. And there have been lots of social interactions that chimps have been observed doing where they share experiences with each other. They they use gestures to kind of indicate interest. But this is something very unique in that it is something that has no function. <laughs> All previously documented referential gestures in primates were given to request something and not just to share attention. So even if it was something that was not, that didn't have a, a function, it's, they were trying to use it to get their attention to do something. This is really just, hey, look at this thing. And then they keep hanging out together and that's it. And um, so this is really just an invitation to do further study. But um yeah, they they examined 80 similar leaf grooming events in order to rule out other explanations, including food sharing and initiating grooming or playing. So they, they, they measured this one against all the other ones. It really seemed unique and different. Co-author Professor Slocomb of the University of York added, quote, while there is a need to identify further examples of this behavior in chimpanzees, our observations indicate that sharing attention for sharing's sake is not unique to humans. It has been argued that our ability to share experiences helped us evolve the cognitive abilities to set us apart from other species, such as our capacity for joint action, cooperation, and language. Our observations raise new questions about why humans share experiences more often than our closest living relatives, and whether engaging in this behavior at a higher frequency than other species can still explain the evolution of cognitive functions underpinning human social behavior. So that's her way of kind of saying like, but we still might be special because we do it a lot. Yeah, we do it more. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's basically what all of social media is, is, hey, look at this. It's just share. It's just (laughs) asking for attention. It's often not asking or, or, for a specific or, action, right? Yeah, just attention. Yeah. Or, or mm-hmm. the wait, my favorite cartoon is uh, is uh, what does it say? The wife is the guy's at the computer, and his wife's like, "Hey, when are you coming to bed?" And he's like, "Somebody on the internet is still wrong." <laughs> Something like he's still correcting things on the internet. Like, no, <laughs> that's that you said the. Uh, well, wait, it was wait, like the joke you know, for a very whenever long. Whenever I hear yeah. those things. Whenever I hear those things in terms of this leading to co- a behavior leading to a cognitive mm-hmm. ability in humans, I'm always like, well, you know, likely all of those cognitive abilities, uh, all those behaviors came about as a result of right. cognitive ability. Like, I, I don't feel like we built small cognitive abilities one by one, then the brain increased to, to you know, have the capacity to continue them. Feel like the brain got the cognitive ability. bigger, yeah. and then there was kind of yeah, yeah. It feels like it went that direction. So, it's as as someone yep. who's spent a lot of time around animals, I can tell you that a, a lot, like almost every animal I've ever seen, really, um, ha- can 
spend attention on something that is visually interesting. And so if they can do that, if they can watch TV or if they can watch humans or if they can um, look at a, a strange object moving in a strange way and just watch passively, then why can't they do this? This just, this seems like a version of that, right? Hey, look at this thing. But it's, it's the, it's the bridge of the social connection of not just, I can watch and, and engage in an, in, in an observation of an interesting thing, but, but I, I want this other else. individual yeah. to also pay attention to this thing. And which requires like a, a knowledge of another being in a space and that they have their own attention span and they are looking or not looking at a thing. Right. So it, like, it, it yeah. requires a lot of complex thought it, to understand the relative nature of other individuals, but theory of mind. Mm -hmm. Right. But it, it doesn't feel impossible no. to me for primates, no. for birds, for other animals. Yeah. And we know that well, I mean, I mean, we have the chimpanzee so many examples young, of... they're the chimpanzee young are just like, jumping around and playing yes. and all over their parents yeah. and like getting their parents attention all the time in all sorts of different physical ways. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this is an older child, right? So maybe this is not playing, but still that, you know, child need for attention and a different right. way to get it. So maybe, you know, this is yes. that kind of next step in mental development of the chimpanzee brain in how that attention is gained. I love that. That yeah. totally makes sense. Because that's, yeah, I mean, we do that too, right? When we get older, we don't ask our parents to like, hey, look, at, look what I can do. And we do a handstand. No, right. we're telling our parents <laughs> about our now. latest achievement or, <laughs> yeah, yeah or, or a thing that we made with our own hands or, you know, just stuff that um, that is kind of at a different level of shared attention. Absolutely. I think that totally makes sense. Yeah, come to my house and share a meal with me. But it, but sure it like could also, talk about a book with you. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I guess I, I don't know why it would be terribly differentiated from uh, from from learning, you know, because we we right. have many examples across the animal kingdom of the older adult showing, you know, orcas show the young how to hunt, and they practice even with the baby seals and stuff like this. We have oh, this is endless. We have the bird that's saying, "Okay, I'm ready to learn," and then you're observing the little bird to see, "Okay, yeah, they looks like they're ready for the singing lesson." Yeah, that because they're paying enough attention. You know, it could also be a form of practice or play for a learning event, which is, you know, mom is always showing the young one here, look at this, here, look at this, and then we do a thing, and the the younger one might be practicing teaching by going. Oh, here, look at this. And but that was the rest of the end of the lesson. There's nothing to there's no there's no learning moment there, but they're they're picking up those pieces where you're getting uh, attention of another one. Uh, yeah. and maybe that young chimp will then have a baby and be like, here's a leaf. Oh yeah, I forgot this lesson goes nowhere. Oh, here's a here's a here's a stick. Let's go let me get termites out of a hill. That one I know how that one is. So it could just be practice yeah. for a, a, a shared learning experience and teaching experience that animals do quite a bit in the animal kingdom. Yeah. I, I think with two animals, it's very hard to say anything, but it's interesting that uh, the behavioral researchers are just noting it as a behavior now mm -hmm. for the first time, separate from yep. others. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the interesting, that's going to allow other observations and differentiations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's all questions. about recognizing that, animals have the capacity for things that we designate as uniquely human, then you yeah. start to see it everywhere. So it's, yeah, you're right. It's, this opens up the opportunity to observe it. Yeah. Yeah. This is This Week in Science. I do hope that you are observing this live streamed podcast or, you know, asynchronous, asynchronously viewed somewhere, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or potentially you're listening to us on a podcast. We love that you're you're with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. And don't forget to head over to twist.org to get your 2023 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. All right, Justin, what you got? It's time for Just Good News. The science news segment that hears the strange growling sound coming from the basement of the recent research lab and goes to investigate the source of the sound with nothing 
but an intermittently operating flashlight and a healthy dose of optimism. It's just good news, Mass Extinction Edition. The no. Earth, the Earth is not currently experiencing a sixth major extinction event. It has been believed by in most scientific circles that the planet Earth, the one we're living on, it was in the midst of the sixth global mass extinction event. Not so, say researchers from the University of California at Riverside and Virginia Tech. So, yay, good news. In the study and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the researchers were exploring life forms around 550 million years old. They found that the percentage of organisms that vanished from this time period to the next was similar to other documented extinction events that killed off nearly 80%, uh, or in this case, killed off nearly 80% of the first complex multicellular life forms on the planet. Uh, this, this form of life was sort of odd looking by more complex future life forms. Lots of orby disc shaped things. Uh, they they only lasted 10 million years, so kind of a flash in the pan evolutionarily. And researchers believe environmental changes were to blame for the extinction event. Geological records, uh, this is quoting uh, Chen Yai Tu of University of California Riverside. He's a paleoecologist and the study's co-author. Geological records show that the world's oceans lost a lot of oxygen during that time. And the few species that did survive had bodies adapted for lower oxygen environments. Though it's not clear why oxygen levels declined at the end of that era, it is clear that environmental change can destabilize and destroy life on Earth at any time point. Such changes have driven all mass extinctions, including the one currently occurring, uh -oh, in which we are losing thousands of species each year due to climate change. Okay, well, I guess if you're counting, we can no longer be considered to be in the sixth major mass extinction event in Earth's history. Turns out it's it's the seventh. Boo. Unlike later events. Thanks, Justin. This earliest one uh, was more difficult to document because the creatures that perished were soft-bodied and did not preserve, preserve well in the fossil record. We humans, on the other hand, will be having an indelible mark on it for future <laughs> paleoecologists to sift through be they chimp or mouse or octopus whoever's running mm, the dolphin. show in the next sentient <laughs> the, the sentient dolphins eh, i'd go orca then if we're gonna go marine that's a type of dolphin it is i guess well, well okay fair enough i know you said that on porpoise ah <laughs> 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 and uh, actually, you know what? I tell you what. Maybe this study's the good news study. We'll make this one the good news study because that one kind of okay. ended badly. What is this one? Out, it was it got tricked me. I don't believe. So this you. has been published in the scientific journal Global Change Biology. It's a study from the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources and the National Institute of Aquatic Resources, Technical University, Denmark, DTU. They found that large numbers of whales have been moving into the waters off eastern Greenland. So whales have found a new home. The once subarctic ecosystem off southeast Greenland, once dominated by large amounts of drifting ice pack, has become more temperate with less sea ice and warmer ocean temperatures. These changes in summer ocean conditions are making the region more attractive for large numbers of fin and humpback whales, as well as other species like tuna. That all sounds great. Dramatic ecological changes such as these are considered regime shifts in the ecological literature. Shifts from one regime to another occur at a tipping point and sometimes uh, reverse, sometimes are not reversible. And the regime shift then can have cascading effects throughout the ecosystem if it is not reversed. This is quoting Professor uh, Professor Miles Peter Heve Jorgensen, Greenland Institute of National Resources. In this case, the new regime will likely become permanent for the foreseeable future unless temperatures cool and the ice export from the north increases again. Continued 21st century climate change makes this scenario unlikely. This event 
uh, this is then Brian McKenzie, National Institute of Aquatic Resources at DTU. This event is so unusual in the past 200 years of summer ice observations in the region. We have seen big changes in some of the upper trophic levels. There are likely many other changes in the ecosystem and food web that have not yet been described and might be part of the reason why highly migratory species are coming to the region. So sort of like the frog guy swallowing situation. They are making observations. They're seeing ice. They're seeing uh, the migratory mammals uh, showing up. But of course, very difficult to really observe the underlying food web uh, that's taking place below to see how dramatic these these changes actually are and how 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 far if, if how far past the tipping point. Though this has apparently been going on for a while. Back in 2012, bluefin tuna were being caught as bycatch in trawl fisheries in the waters off off east, uh, east Greenland, which was something that had never been encountered before and got a lot of attention back then. Since then, large numbers of fin and humpback whales have been showing up. They started to occur together with temperate species like dolphins, killer whales, pilot whales. At the same time, observations of high Arctic species, narwhal, walrus, started to decreasing. dwindle. Yeah. Decreasing. So they're getting pushed out uh, either by either by the water temperatures or by the other species that are moving in. Don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I mean, all these animals are are also governed by the things they eat, right? Which is what they were getting to talking about the trophic level. The food so, web. right, right. So, so yeah. the the animals that are leaving are likely leaving because their food source has left. It could it could be their food source has left. It could be the other that the other ones are migrating because their food source moved in down mm-hmm. below, right? Yeah, Absolutely. but you think something like mackerel, which is more of a feeder fish, would be uh, indicative. So the levels there are dwindling, and then you see some of the, you know, the predators that would have been eating the mackerel or predators that would have been eating tuna. But, yeah, there are probably many different situations we can consider. Who's the predator? Mm-hmm. Who's the prey? And what are we seeing happen? Yeah, they say this uh, the ecological shift. Uh, in East Greenland has been also driven by the decline in summer ice drift. So we know Greenland's melting. So you think, oh, there should be more ice drifting ar- around, right? There should be more of that, that stuff going on. So it turns out, which this is something I didn't know, which I've just learned from this study, that most of this ice drift that you see off of Eastern Greenland, and I've seen it before. I've, I've The route that uh, flies... The planes fly over Greenland to get to Denmark. They they go right over eastern Greenland. And there is this amazing area where it just seems like an endless expanse of drifting ice coming off the, the Iceland shelf. Right. Or the, the Greenlandic shelf. <clears throat> but it's not from Greenland, which I had always thought. That ice all forms uh, north of Alaska and then slowly churns out uh, over Greenland and then gets like sort of accelerated out to sea yeah. from there. So uh, apparently it's not as endless as I thought because it's been in decline. And that is why, uh, partly why maybe the, there's the warmer temperature or the, the more room for air breathing mammals to get in there and, and utilize, uh, uh, utilize that water. So the good yeah. news of this, it's like a new normal. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. New uh, <laughs> new place for whales to hang out. Yeah. For a lot, most, a lot of whales. Okay. Except for the narwhal. You go, and the if you, yeah, walrus. if you want to go whale watching, <clears throat> yeah. go, to, go Green- to Greenland. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just good but You got to find the silver lining in all of the, you know. Do you? <laughs> just good news. I, mean, I like to find the silver linings somewhere in there. <laughs> All right, I have a couple of stories before we close out the show. Number one, um, if you enjoy putting on makeup on a daily basis or on an occasional basis, and you're just not excited about the foundation, the concealer, all the stuff that you think you need to make your skin even and flawless, and look, I have no pores. 
And anyway, that's not going to happen. But new research just published in Vision Research the Journal uh, has studied whether or not just applying makeup to the eyes, lips, eyes and lips impacts how people see your skin. And they did digital makeup ap application in pictures, uh, comparing pictures with even skin using concealer foundation, no thing, no makeup at all, or just makeup applied to the eyes and the lips. And they also did a uh, real professionally applied makeup, you know, to real people, not just digital makeup um, comparison. And they determined that people see your skin as more flawless when makeup is only applied to the eyes and the lips. Yes. So wow. if you just want to do the mascara and the lipstick, Heck you know, yeah. maybe a little bit of eyeshadow or something, it's going to draw the attention of people's visual field um, away from the specifics of the rest of your face and potentially uh, give the impression that your skin is more flawless than it actually is without having to conceal anything. So I'm going to pretend that I knew this result all along <laughs> yes. because I am too lazy to put on concealer. And so I think I have put on concealer less than a dozen times in my entire life. So <laughs> I'm going to pretend it's I knew it. I knew, knew it, it. And I just paid attention to the eyes and the lips. That's it. Don't worry about the rest. I love this. Save so yep. much money and time. So much as a, time. As yes. somebody who has never uh, really worn makeup but uh, has observed... That concealer stuff or whatever, you know, those bases, the foundation. Or whatever, those, cover, those can go very easily wrong. They become extremely noticeable if they're caked on or applied unevenly or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just, just, yeah, just avoid it. Just skip that. Just go with this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Eyes and lips. Yeah. There you go. We think we need, we think we need all the makeup, but yeah. you know, you, you don't. You know. All those contouring videos on TikTok. Who needs them? Needs them. Um, you know, it, it, it does, this research does really kind of get at some of the, uh, of previous research that suggests that when people are looking at faces, our visual system, our brain, and the way that we recognize faces is actually more of a holistic um, uh, view and that we are looking at things that are important for communication. So mm -hmm. the eyes yeah. and the mouth are very important for communicating messages and very important for behavioral communication. And so that's why this seems like it makes a lot of sense, right? You don't, why pay attention to those little tiny details that observers' brains are not necessarily paying attention to anyway. The eyes and the lips have it, everyone. That's great. That's what our brains like. Yes. So, you know, Thanksgiving, tomorrow, if you feel like you need to put on that makeup, don't. It's your family. Just it's eyes fine. and lips. That's just all. Which lips. the lips, you don't even have to bother because you're going to eat. Gonna so eat. the lips are going to wear right off. So just the eyes and even forget about that. Just, yeah, just go have a good time, everybody, and forget about all the just makeup at all. Just as you are, you know? No, although although I, I hate to perpetuate any sort of uh, women or anybody should wear makeup kind of a stereotype because i i i've never really <laughs> cared for it uh but i had this uh, this dear friend that i worked with and she had very faint eyelashes she's blonde but she had very faint eyelashes and if she didn't wear mascara she would she's like oh i didn't wear mascara today justin i'm like oh okay that's fine she's like yes but now everybody's asking if i'm sick Oh yeah. She would look, See, she this has is the like... thing that happens. If you regularly wear makeup and you don't yeah. wear it one day, everyone will ask you if you are sick or tired. They do, Those, they, that's nobody what can pick up why. But it's like, are you tired? Did you sleep last night? Are you coming down with something? She's like, oh, I gotta go do makeup. the makeup. This this is go the do the makeup what you do I'm is Ill. you just never wear it. Never and then if you it. occasionally yeah. wear it, then everyone's like, oh my god, you look gorgeous. Exactly. But like otherwise, just like normal every day. Otherwise, this is the problem that I ran into uh, was in my last job. I wore a lot more makeup than I used to. And I would, if I would ever tone it down, it was, oh, are you sick? 
Do you need to go home? <laughs> no. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm sorry I didn't Tammy Faye it. Come on. Yeah. All right. So on my final story, I do want to have us think about the birds and think about what the birds eat mm -hmm. before we eat them. But I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about turkeys. We are going to discuss the great bustard male. Oh. The great <gasps> bustard. This boy. That's a bigot, right? There yeah, go. these are these are a, a, a lecking species, very grouse-like. Mm -hmm. um, they have a big front patch of feathers, and they puff up their chests to impress the females, and they have big tail feathers that they fluff up when they're trying to impress the ladies. And they really do want to be as healthy as they can be. Uh, some researchers were looking into uh, whether or not birds, these birds in, in specific, choose their diet as a way to accentuate their health. And so their study in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution it suggests that they seek out plants with compounds that can actually kill pathogens. So they determined that during the, uh, the, the mating season, these great bustards, according to co-author Dr. Azucena Gonzalez Coloma from the Institute of Agricultural Sciences in Madrid, the great bustards seek out two species of weeds that are also used by humans in traditional medicine. We show that both contain antiprotozoal and nematicidal worm-killing compounds, while the second also contains antifungal agents. They compared these birds in uh, the Iberian Peninsula to uh, see what they were eating during different times of the year, and they found that during the spring season, the uh, droppings that they collected, they didn't watch them, they just looked observed the poop of the birds no need <laughs> poop tells the story <laughs> it tells the story 623 droppings from female and male bustards during uh the mating season in april and uh they looked at tissue that was left over from stems and leaves and flowers from about 90 different plant species that grow in the area and they showed that two species the papaver roeus and the Echium plantagenium. Uh, these are the corn poppy and the purple vipers bug gloss that are eaten more than expected from their relative abundance compared to uh, the amount of plants locally in the environment and how much is actually in the diet. So that's what these males are out yeah. doing. They're like, let me get some of that bug gloss and be So healthy. they're showing up to the lek. They got their... Um... Their shake, uh, shake. kind of cup with the with the wire ball in it that they shake up, right? That has the uh, the creatine in it and the vitamin C boost and all this stuff. And they're like, "Yeah, I'm ready. I'm juicing. I'm ready. I'm ready for you." That's right. No, I don't have any nematodes. That's right. No protozoans on me. That's right. I'm yoked. Um, I'm ready to go. Yeah. The researchers, the authors, tested the uh, activity of. The molecular fractions that they had obtained from these plants that they had looked at, they found that the uh, molecules, the alkaloids, uh, essential oils, others, um, actually were very successful against Trichomonas gallinae, which is a protozoa, uh, nematode, a parasitic worm, and meloidiga, that's Meloidogyne javanica, and the fungus, Aspergillus niger. So... Uh, this is interesting because it suggests that not only humans are capable of seeking out food for their medicinal properties, that Love birds it. do it, we do it. That's right. Um, everybody's trying to stay healthy, and it's fascinating. I mean, we've talked I've, we've talked also about like catnip and other uh, other plants yeah. that our our animals enjoy uh, potentially having these kinds of medicinal uses. And so it's just interesting. The male birds who need to show off and be healthy, look at what I'm eating. Right. The question is, where does this this behavior come from, right? So like when we 
we get cravings sometimes because we are deficient in something. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't really feel like that. It feels like they're trying to boost something. So it, 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 if they're getting a craving, it's not because they're deficient. It's because yeah, their so hormones guess... are telling them or... Yeah, so I mean, maybe I that know. is that is the question. Um, were these birds infected with right. protozoans or nematodes coming into the season, and then the plants helped them, or uh, and is that what led to them eating these foods more? Or or when they get a spike in testosterone, do they just mm -hmm. crave these foods? And where does right. that come from? Is that something in their genetics? I don't we, know. We so don't, bizarre. Yeah. Is it something yeah, I mean, that's all, learned? It's... A lot of animal food preference, I have to assume, is genetic. You know, it, how much of it is learned? How much of it is genetic? How much mm -hmm. of it is microbiome driven? Because then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you're learning a little bit from your parents, then maybe that microbiome gets uh, situated early and then that takes right. over. But it could be, it could just be, you know, this was a long time ago food preference for yeah. some segment of a bird population. Uh, and then, then come the nematodes and the what have you, here comes the, the, and then now the, all those birds that didn't eat these plants are gone. And so what you're left with- But it's with only during one do. time of the year, right? It's right. only during- But is that also season. when the plants are there? Or is it could also plants be... year round? Like the poppy but... isn't year round. But it was relative. There, there's all sorts of other plants hmm. around, but they just happened yeah, to be yeah. eating them more, and the males were eating them more than the females. Anyway, right. what is your turkey eating before you eat your turkey? Probably corn, right? Is that <laughs> probably? Yeah, probably. If you're uh, eating the meats, some people are having ham, some people are having turkey, some people are having tofu. Doesn't matter what you eat, just matters that you are able to share time and a little bit of gratitude for all the things that we've got and the people who are in our lives at this very moment and the science that has brought us all together. I think we've made it to the end of another show and I just wanna say thank you all so much. I'm grateful, so grateful. All right, who do I? need to say thank you to. I want to say thank you, Justin Blair. Thank you for being yes. co-hosts. Really love thank getting you. to do the show with you every week. Really love it. Yes. Thank you, Fada, for yeah. all your help. Thank on... you for uh, also showing up. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Okay. <laughs> um, Fada, thank you so much for your help on social media and getting those show notes done. Really appreciate that. Gord, Arnlore, others who help keep the chat rooms very happy places to be. Thank you for your time and your effort. Um, Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. People who are watching and are in our chat rooms, on our Twitch, our Facebook, our uh, YouTube channel, thank you for being here while we're doing the show live and for talking and for being a part of what we're talking about. Really love having you here. And as always, I would love to say thank you to our patrons. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazard, Ralphie Figueroa, Ra John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Bigard Shefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alboran, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Gretis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Matt Bass, Vote Beto for Texas, I guess, next time. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessen, Flo, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Picararo, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you so much for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. 
we also have our calendars for sale for 2023 at twist.org as well. On next week's show. We will be back 8 p.m. Pacific time, 5 a.m. the next day, Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you bake a pie from scratch. I listen to podcasts while I baked a pie today. Just search for This Week in Science or podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, as well as the ability to sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly, email Kiki at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBez at Twist.org. And I will put a special tease in there that you can email me at BlairBez at Twist.org if you have a particular item that you want to buy from Zazzle with a particular piece of art on it for the holidays. There's still time. There's a bunch of promo codes right now in Zazzle, so just email me and I will make it and post it in our store. If you do email any of us, just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line or your email. It'll be uh, grabbed by a toad tongue and pulled down towards the heart of that toad via their hyoid, and then they're going to swallow it, not using their eyes, and uh, well, I'm never going to read it. So just put twist in the subject line. Thank you. <laughs> and until uh, we uh, we can figure out what a mastodon uh, is and how to, I got to go to Twitter to figure out how to get on mastodon. Is basically, the thing. Uh, we are still on the Twitter for now, where we are at Twist Science, at Doctor Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address. A suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to in the night. Please remember. Or please we'll let us be back know. here next. <laughs> Threw me for a loop. Uh, we will be back <laughs> next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, please remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science... Well, you just may understand that this is the after show. I was thinking that this is the new Twist Piecast where we will talk about pies. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I made an apple pie today. I love apple pie. I, yeah, I like making apple pie. I need an apple pie. I got a pumpkin pie. <sighs> I don't know. Unfortunately, for the R, uh, due to the RSVs, my Thanksgiving celebration is not going to be as family-filled as it was going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, better for people to be safe and healthy. Yeah. Yeah, than to bring a nice little virus into the house. That yeah. is what we've learned from the last several years, right? At least some of us. Some of us. 
Yes. So that it's more important to stay safe and not get other people sick than to do and, things that you're committing to doing. Well, yeah. And okay. also, yeah. And if, if it's going to take a lot of effort to do the thing, if it's going to take a lot of effort that might make you more tired and might not make you recover as well, also, it's bad for you. It's bad for others. It's bad, 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 bad. Just get better. Mm -hmm. We'll see each other later. Just get better. Yes, come later. It's fine. Yeah. I'll save some turkey it, for you. It's pretty crazy how we used to uh, do things sick all the time. <laughs> it's yes, it's astounding to me. Like I watch like old reruns of sitcoms and things, and people go to work just so sick, and that's a that's a plot point in a sitcom because that was expected. We all went to work really sick. Yeah, I would go to work, and I'd like have my Vicks Vapo Rub and my box of tissues and my. Mm -hmm. Sudafed and my yep. tea and it's just like nope this is my this is this is my kit for today because I'm sick I go to work <laughs> I just yep. need some extra items and that's it no no <laughs> no 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 stay home I really please. <laughs> I really hope we keep that I do too yeah I you know more support for days off and more sick days and not punishing people for mm -hmm. being sick you know, it's, yeah. I mean, don't make it something that, you know, just let people. Ugh, Paul Disney, you have sitcoms. <laughs> yes. Ooh, in the chat room, our Discord, we have a banana custard banana pie. Wait, no, banana custard blackberry pie. There we go. <laughs> A banana custard blackberry mm. pie. That sounds amazing. I want to eat that. It sounds very delicious. No banana. No, no. No bananas? That's right. No banana. We had the whole conversation about the banana flavor, and you were very anti-banana uh -uh. flavor. Uh -uh. Yes. Nope. No uh -uh. banana. Uh -uh. <laughs> 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 Say it a little uh -uh. bit. Gosh. <laughs> we have gotten into the grunting portion of the after show. No Blair... banana. <laughs> Blair uh -uh. can only speak in grunts related to no banana. No banana. No bananas. <laughs> yes, we eat no bananas. <laughs> no, yes, no, yes. Yeah, admit you're sick. It's okay. It's not that much of a weakness. It just happens to people. No, never admit, uh, never submit, never give in. Wait, you can't galaxy quest us on the immune system. Come on. Yeah, you can. Uh -uh. You can totally power through a lot of stuff. Uh, if you just face it's not mind that over you matter. Should. Mind over matter, people. We've got this great cognitive ability. Just power through it. You can do it. <laughs> It's fine. Your your allergies, you know, no, whatever. You no problem. No, sick, so just, no worries. We've just talked about this sick, before. You can do it. Just pop a cap. We've cup talked of about this before. Whatever. I had like zero compassion for people with allergies. I'm like, okay, whatever. It's air. You can't be allergic <laughs> to air. You have to get over it. And then I I moved to uh, to an area where that I was allergic to something in the air, to where. I couldn't go outside without crying and uh, the snot factory would get cranked up and just like, oh, I can't be out and I can't breathe it. And I had I instantly got that compassion that you only get from finally walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. And I, and I did have some some level of regret for having mocked people with allergies. But uh, but, you know, if you got if you're allergic to where you live, move. There's other places. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's uprooting, it's changing the job and changing moving where your family is. But you, if the air is not breathable for you, find somewhere that is. It's worth it. It's totally worth it. Go, go where the where the air is breathable, where the weather suits you. Oh gosh, tell you what. One of the reasons I moved to Denmark uh, was for the was for the weather. 
For the weather, well, yes. May have been a little misinformed. But uh, winter just hit. Yes, winter oh, darkness. Winter just hit. It was and... snowing the other day. It stopped. Oh. It's it's right. Apparently, De- Denmark is is much warmer uh, for some reason than it uh, was in the past. But gosh, when the wind blows and uh, it's, it can oh, it can be cold. It can still get cold here. It's not that bad though. It's not really Just put on a sweater. Get yourself a windbreaker. Have a good one. But I'm definitely not allergic to anything in Denmark, which is nice. Well, that's There's good. nothing. I don't, I've never. I've. I grew up in the Central Valley where people, uh, like every third person, has an allergy to something there, and I never allergic was affected. To everything. Never was affected by it. And then I didn't move, but I guess I was working in the Petaluma area, uh, north of San Francisco there. And I don't know if it was the chicken plucking plants or the cottonwood mm-hmm. trees or what what it was, but there was something there in the, during the summer that just got me. Oh, gosh. And I tried everything. I've taken, uh, popping the Claritin uh, pills and the, I'm eating the local honey and it's nothing. Nothing was working. Nothing is working. I was like, ah, I got to change jobs. That was it. That was the reason. I would have I would have been totally happy there, except, yeah, if you can't breathe the air, you got to move. You do. That's just how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, nap. I sometimes so think is... I'm mildly allergic to the universe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think usually. I'm like, I, I, if it's one season, it's the moldy season. It's like the moist, moldy season in Portland, or it's the dry, dusty season. Either way, there's pollen or mold, and I'm allergic to it. <laughs> like, this is great. Awesome. It's the upside to being kind of a kind of redheaded. Da, da, da. But it is. Thanksgiving time, everyone here yeah. in the United States. Are you, uh, do you do any, did we talk about this, Justin? Do you do, it's, does, I it's, didn't, I didn't really do it when I was in the States. Yeah, okay. Hmm. I didn't, like, it's such an, uh, I don't know. The entire premise of it, of the holiday, is so disgusting to me that, like, I can, I can skip it. I've, I've skipped yeah. it for years. I really I've partaken with other people's time. families, but I would never yeah. like throw, uh, uh, put on a, a Thanksgiving thing. Be like, let's all be thankful on this day. Remember back when the pilgrims were starving to death, and the the natives uh, got them through and taught them how to be self sustaining and sustainable, and really saved their lives. Yeah. And then we committed yep. genocide against them. Genocide, Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, let's be thankful for the for those kind people who we then committed genocide against willfully yeah. over generations. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, this is horrible. I can still, I, I mean, it's it it is a national holiday here in the United States, and although yeah. it comes from a horrible history, yeah. I think we can take it and you know give it our own meaning, and you know, in the same way that atheists celebrate Christmas. <laughs> You know, you enjoy the day for whatever it brings to you. So for me, yeah. any time that I can come together with family or friends and, um, you know, make new memories and be able to but take see, actually but... take time to, to yeah. enjoy and be grateful, to be thankful. Like that is, I think that's important. Um, but I mean, Christmas I don't think... to an atheist is, is one thing because it's, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, you got the, the presents and the trees and all that kind of stuff. I love Christmas. I just really enjoy it. Uh, however, it's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not like connected cooking? to a, to a genocide. Uh, so, okay. Correct. So I'm going to, I'm going to push back on you here because. Yeah. Christmas is connected to a lot of nasty things, if you want to totally. look at it. However, yeah. Thanksgiving, uh, it's a while, while holiday, its foundation okay. and how we use it in the United States is abhorrent, it is based in the idea of a harvest festival, which all cultures have. Well, 
all cultures have a harvest okay. festival. And if you want to look at it as a fall harvest festival where you sit mm-hmm. down to a meal of plenty and you talk about what you're thankful for and you get two days off if you're in the United States. And so you spend that time to travel or prepare for a special meal and have that time with your family. As long as you can acknowledge that there are bits of it that are gross, just like with Christmas, there's yes. something to be gained there. And if you yes. want to call it a harvest festival, just like you might want to call Christmas a solstice festival, there are these past secular origins beyond the thing that we prescribe yeah. to it now. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, you can always, you can always do that. Yes. That is right. the one That's way what I'm of... saying. If you're, if you can, it's, it's hard to pick and choose, right. If you're going to use that, that theory behind it, because like I said, just like Christmas is a solstice festival at its core, right. This is a harvest festival. So it's, yeah. I that's all I'm trying to say is that if if you enjoy Thanksgiving, I enjoy Thanksgiving for those aspects of it. Mm-hmm. It's and I love cooking and sharing sharing food with others and the whole that whole thing. I think yeah, is so cool. I know and, like, and, and you're right. Fire people, your can, people can like, yeah. People can pick and choose. Absolutely, people yes. can pick and choose. And I this did. This isn't yours. And that's you, how I yeah. picked and chose it. And that's what I that's looked at. Great. I was like, okay. All of the iconography, I mean, maybe it's gone away. Maybe people don't do this anymore, but there was always images of pilgrims, you know, and then all of the iconography. It depends on where you went to school. And and when you went to school. And when you went to school. When, where. Yeah. Yeah. I I think things are changing now because, and I think that's important. And like Blair said, you know, it's acknowledging where, where everything came from, you know, all of the bump sports and all but um you know there are only so many days in a year do we gotta we have to enjoy some of them can we yeah can we can we do that together yeah <laughs> you know the thing though is the, the thing that i just still find trouble it's it's there's an attitude in the united states that the native population used to be there. The native population is still there. Is still there, yes. And yeah. and to have yeah. a national holiday celebrating yeah. the harvest from their lands based uh, loosely on a story of an act of generosity uh, on their part that, well, the that, way the story is was, told, too, is like a complete falsification of yeah. the actual events and what happened. Yeah. You know, it's like taking the original story and it's like, oh, I'm going to just, if we add a little, oh, look, it's a whole new statue. It, oh, look, it's, this is brand new. It's perfect. You know, you know, it's, a, it's become its own. Uh, the story that was told is it does a disservice yeah. to everyone in the nation. Yeah, and you're right. We can't forget there are people still here. They didn't go anywhere. So I'm I'm They're also looking because I'm very curious at what um, Canadian Thanksgiving, what the it, origins what is that, for November that 8th? is. It's actually, it is. It seems like a it's a, one. it's in October. Okay, it's the October. second Monday in October, okay. and it is a harvest festival. Yeah. Um, and it Halloween. started in 1879. <laughs> So it's yeah. pretty old. Yeah. Canadian yeah. Thanksgiving is very old. Um, and uh, it so this one appears to be much more just like a harvest festival. Yeah. So I think, you know, if you can kind of. <laughs> well, if you stay out of the cues, genocide, but they yeah. didn't. Canadians right. didn't stay out of the genocide. Oh, either. yeah, for it sure. Was- no, the big time, big time culpable yeah. <laughs> for sure. Not good stuff. And again, when you say stayed out of, and as when we talk about it historically, uh, there are people alive today in California who were taken away from their parents to Mm -hmm. Indian relocation re education centers. Re education camps, yeah. The kids were taken away or put into foster Mm -hmm. homes to to be to to integrate them into white society. Mm -hmm. Uh, This. This is this is a lot. This is this is pretty darned recent history. 
you know? Yeah. And it's, it, there's mind blowing stuff too. Like there was the, uh, the family who, who, uh, the African American family that owned some beachfront property in Huntington Beach or wherever it was, somewhere, mm-hmm. down, somewhere down there in Los Angeles. Bruce's Beach. And they yeah. just returned that, that land was, was mm-hmm. totally stolen from them by the city. It was just returned mm-hmm. to them. Well, yeah. not even a generation before that, that was native land. So wait a second. Yeah. Whose land are you giving to who? For what reason? Like, yeah, the, you know the whole, the whole history of of America is one of occupation, which is why you know, like occupation, and then and also then propaganda and uh, you know and genocide and genocide and. Yeah, and even cultural, you know, even in the 1900s, physical. after we were supposedly giving Native Americans in the United States uh, land back and doing, starting to make certain reparations, even into the 1960s, 1970s, there still have been, you know, even even now there are still instances where we're we're pushing people to the side, where our government is, you know, saying one thing and then doing another, and. Uh, Look no further than the Bay in San mm-hmm. Francisco. There's an island out there that was claimed for, from the Native Americans that was to be returned to them if the government stopped using it as a prison. Oh. They they shut down Alcatraz. So, yeah, there, I was going to say, the there's, a really, there's a really never... good documentary that you can watch actually released by the National Park the, Service, which is interesting yes, because it is currently run by the National Park Service now. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah, in honor of Thanksgiving, it might be worth watching. You, it's like a 20 minute video or something, and you can watch mm. all about, um, the Native American, um, occupation of Alcatraz and kind of the two years that followed and the resolution. And in the end, the resolution was that the government told them that they were going to bring the deed and give them the Island. And then they just arrested and removed them all instead. So good stuff. <laughs> just definitely. <laughs> Awesome. following similar suit nice. to kind of like small pox, pox blankets and other kind of uh fun kind of fun family uh, story trickery uh, my, yeah fun family story my uncle was there very my cool uncle, uh, my uncle uh, i helped occupy the island that's uh, awesome when, uh, oh. when my power was uh, was there yeah wow that's very cool oh this are, so uh apparently on netflix escape to alcatraz Hmm. There's a documentary series mm, by Hulu. This is and it is a it is a very uh, it is a very sad actually uh, tale uh, because the some of the leaders of the movement who were there uh, organizing the occupation who were reclaiming the land, uh, reclaiming the uh, the island. Uh, the leader and his his wife, I guess, the two of them. Uh, were were sort of organizing and getting the interest in, in bringing this fight, and they had a, a child uh, who was there with them that was doing some rock climbing or something, or fell and died. Oh no! And so the that's really when that movement uh, collapsed. Yeah. It would the police arresting people alone wouldn't have wouldn't have done it. That would not no, there were only 15 when, people still there when they did that. Yeah, so it was very easy because, to do. But at one point there were like a thousand people on that island. Yeah. Like was, so when, yeah. when the when the child died, the leaders uh, of the movement, the people who have been organizing everything, uh, had another whole world of thing going on with them. And and they, I guess, sort of probably just lost uh, the heart to have a fight right then. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should we tell Justin what the Danes and other Vikings got up to? What are you talking about? <laughs> so I will tell you, well, I will tell you I mean, what I think. Are my, happened. Those are my people's, right? The uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'll tell you what I happened from. <laughs> because from what I can tell, the, the, the people of Denmark are very calm, very polite. Very, they're not the type who are going to come and take your land from you. Because I think what happened is this form of natural selection took place where all the really aggressive people were put on boats and sent to England. 
And then they'd come back. It's like, hey, we've raided. Oh, great. Let's have a party. And we're going to reload everything in the boats and send you off again. They just did that over and over again. To the Vikings were like, you know, every time we go home, they they pack it, they pack up the boats and send us off again. Maybe we should just stay. Yeah. And they finally got the clue. Like, so all the all the aggressive people were weaned out of Denmark. Uh, in these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my theory. They all left. So there's none of the all aggressive. All swallowed by their mothers. <laughs> all the none aggressive the colonists, left. the conquerors and colonists all went to England and became uh, uh, kings and queens and ran it. And then they started an empire from there that went on for a really long time. Then all those people, uh, all those aggressive uh, people left England and uh, ended up in the United States where they did it again. So yeah, you're right. Maybe uh, maybe the Vikings are to blame. And you kind of trace it all the way back. Um, yep. Sorry. Were they the the aggressive people that went to America? I thought it was all of the um, puritanical people who came so to America. Was, yeah. What's that more aggressive that. than that? <laughs> no, passive aggressive. It's you know. And then they get aggressive. As soon as they have any power, they get aggressive aggressive. Yeah, like, they did. Yeah, well, We're gonna take our space. Yeah. We're in the right because yeah. our beliefs tell us that we are. We are. Uh, yeah. We're the yeah. special people. Yes. Yeah. It's nice Certainly. to be the special people. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd all like to be special people sometimes. But, you know, you're all special to me. Huh. Yeah. You ready to hit the hay? So you can eat pie tomorrow, Blair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Still got to bake some biscuits and make some sweet potatoes and finish cleaning my house. Yeah, I need to do a lot of things and <laughs> I haven't done anything because I watched Andor today. Yeah. And now, yeah, now I'm going to make food. Um, but I was going to have... A guest bring mashed potatoes, but then they called in sick, so I don't have any potatoes now. So, oh I no! I didn't shop for potatoes because that wasn't that wasn't my responsibility. So you now I have cart to, baby. <laughs> now I have to figure out how I'm gonna have potatoes to put my gravy in because I have to oh, have man. a little potato bowl to put the gravy in because that makes me happy. <laughs> I mean, I'd be happy to bring you some potatoes, but I'm kind of far away. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Too far away to bring me potatoes. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. Well, wherever you are, Justin, don't enjoy tomorrow or today because it would be today for you. Don't enjoy it. It's don't enjoy it today, at all. Yeah. Just have just a regular old day that you don't enjoy that much. Just okay. It's just fine. Don't be no, thankful. No, it's fine. Today <laughs> is, I'm very thankful. Uh, today is my older daughter's birthday. So. Oh. I will be celebrating, just uh, just different than uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, happy birthday to her. I'm Blair, oh, have a like, good Thanksgiving feast, and thanks, everyone out there. Yeah. yeah. What, Justin? Oh, I was just gonna say, oh, say good night, Blair. Yes. Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. <gasps> Good, Good night. night, Kiki. Kiki. The lag. It's great. Good night, everyone. I hope you all enjoy tomorrow, today. Be grateful. Science does say being grateful is good for your mental health. Makes your days a little bit better. So I'm grateful for you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay well fed this week. And uh, stay curious. We'll see you again next week for another episode of Twists. Have a good one. Thank you.